The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. The world, and in particular Canada, needs to embrace entrepreneurialism as a new frontier to resuscitating our gasping economy, says Nassim Javid, the CEO and founder of Expothon. We need a new ministry of entrepreneurialism that can ignite an economic revolution, he adds. Javid says this new ministry will only work if it's managed by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. Bureaucrats, academics, and economists live in a world where frequently their theories don't survive contact with the real world. When you put them in charge of entrepreneurship, they pour sand in the gears of innovation, business agility, and the magic small and medium-sized businesses create in solving the world's challenges. The potential is enormous. Canada has an opportunity to embrace this concept, says Javid. We are a knowledge-based country, and if we seize the moment and create a legislative and tax environment that fosters rather than hinders entrepreneurs, we can turn around Canada's sagging per capita GDP and boost the economy. I invited Nassim Javid to join me for a conversation that matters about unleashing the power of entrepreneurship in an effort to turn around sinking economies in Canada and around the world. Nassim, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. That's wonderful. You are uh, an entrepreneur to the core, aren't you? What, what brought you to this point where you said, yes, I want to be able to go out and create opportunities that solve challenges or fill gaps in marketplaces? I guess it's a combination of call, combination of circumstances and situations. Uh, I was very lucky when I came to Canada 50 years ago uh, to get an opportunity to work with Jean Drapeau, the man who brought Expo 67 and of course the 1976 Summer Olympics. I spending few years with him in the Olympics taught me at a very early age that there were 117 countries, their national anthem, their flags, their languages, their culture, their business model. When you look around the, around the globe and look at the economic situation, the largest asset a nation has today, more than its resources, lumber is not the resource is the human talent, is the citizenry that is capable to stand up to global age competitiveness. Now, when we talk about the SME, they are the largest contributor of taxes, they're the largest contributor on job creation, and they are the driving engine of the economy. For the last two decades, all these countries that we are engaging and talking couple of dozen at a time, they all have identical problems. They have neglected the SMEs, they have abandoned them, and they just give a lip service like a SME week, a couple of days here, or train a busload of SMEs, or have some award nights. And that is not sufficient. The world has changed. 100 years ago, when there was an SME, they would operate and live in the same town for 100 years without going outside, without traveling, without getting an outside business. Why? There was no transportation, there was no technology, there was no communication, there's nothing. Today, if you are operating a small business from any village, any town, any city, any penthouse, any office, any corporation, anywhere, you have 10,000 shopping centers, 10,000 cities, and 10,000 opportunities accessible around the clock from the time. SMEs, if they are properly organized, they can become micro power business centers. Now, historic component. America, 100 years ago, before economic books were invented, were a successful, industrialized, agriculture, agro-industrialized society growing up and then kept growing. And from that pool of SMEs, 
became where the organization became national and they became global it it changed the total outlook on 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 the globe now so so let me ask you what happened uh because there was of course that frontier men mentality in north america and particularly in the united states people said uh, I need to do something. I cannot be relying on a system that's that's uh, going to look after me. I actually need to go out and take responsibility or find an opportunity. What happened to us that we seem to move away from that and want security rather than uh, running the risk, because that's what it is, of going and venturing out on our own as entrepreneurs? Fact. Everybody is born an entrepreneur. It's a natural instinct towards survival. Take a look at a mother, a simple mother, how she takes the minimal resources and maximizes to protect the family and build the organization, even at the risk of her own life, protects the, protects the family. And the she is one of the best entrepreneurs. Now, we, because our friends and our family, they love us so much, they try to we strip this natural talent because they say, look, our forefathers were in agriculture. So you want to become a film producer? You want to fly a plane? You want to have some rotary engine going in the car? And that's how they try to rip away all this talent. But the fact is, what America did, it was done in Germany. It was done in the old China. It was done in the Silk Road. It was done in the historic. Entrepreneurialism has existed with us since the hunter-gatherer times. Now, because the, those people who came out of the caves were not thrown out by the landlords. They were entrepreneurs who wanted to go and expand the market. So the, the question is that how China, within the last 30 years, had become the most revolutionary SME-based economy that now coming to surface. And what do you think India is doing today with millions and millions and hundreds of millions of young entrepreneurs that are coming to the thing and what Indonesia is going to do. So the, my question to the Western economy, including Canada, is very simple. By creating 20 companies like Facebook and 10 companies like Tesla, you cannot run an economy. You cannot run a national economy. By creating sophisticated high technology cluster and creating IP and financial access, you cannot create the grassroots economy. Grassroots economy is people like you and people like us that who go out and take the risk and create opportunities and grow. And America, North America culture was based on that 30, 40, up till 30, 40 years ago. And today is in very serious trouble. And I think that with the new revolution, uh, the SMEs will come back to the surface because all the technology is there. Do you know, uh, Stuart, that $1,000 buys in technology, which used to be $10 or million dollar 20 years ago? All right. This is the kind of tool that's available to the SMEs today. I got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So to carry on with this point of moving towards having a ministry of entrepreneurialism, because I, I agree with you, I think that we have lost that uh, ability to risk. We've nurtured ourselves into places of uh, safety and security. Uh, but we've also built a legislative and tax system that uh, prevents people from uh, working their way through the enormous challenge of starting small businesses. Um, it's as though you come out of the starting gate, but you're expected to have all the same systems and live within the same tax regime of companies that have decades of experience and teams. What do we need to do collectively to be able to say, no, we have to embrace the spirit of go figure it out? Because the moment you run into any sort of legislation or uh, government agency, 
they want to stop that because you have to fit in to the way in which they want the economy or the system to run. I'm running this 10 years on a very high intensity on a global stage. And I'll tell you why we are gaining global attention. Yesterday at the World Economic Forum 2024, Xavier Millis clearly said, which is apparently, according to the social media, the best speech, he clearly said, the entrepreneurialism, they are the heroes. They are the ones who are going to save the economy. And he articulated our argument, which we have mentioned five, 10 years ago, that a successful entrepreneurialism existed before the economic books and economic rules and the school of economics were established. Yesterday, he clearly said in his speech that for, from 1800 to the modern time, we were doing, society was doing great. Only in the last two, three decades, economy, economic thinking, economic planning has overtaken. So now printing currency, running inflation, balancing in special interest rates, managing, monetizing, bringing the whole system through financial manipulation is very different than value creation, which is the entrepreneurial mysticism proven over a whole millennia that how it was done. So to create a ministry, very simple. A lot of governments are interested, just like there was a time that there were no ministry of happiness. There was no ministry of women affairs. There was no ministry even of small business. What it requires is a good, calm, intelligent narrative. And you are absolutely right. As, like we have written aggressively that the government should consider opening up 1 million to 5 million visa to entrepreneurs who want to park and land in a place, give them a special visa so they land in your country and create the, bring the entrepreneurial revolution. Second, a, an entrepreneurial organization can survive without taxation, without paperwork, without all these things. That can be done later once they are properly organized and they become profitable. Why? Should a small company do the same form that goes to a multi-billion dollar company in terms of compliance? Why it is why the government cannot take a look at the citizenry and say, if you have X million of entrepreneurs, there are, there are countries with 100 million entrepreneurs. Why not treat them as a valuable asset? Because calling an SME small is the greatest error of economic thinking. It's like calling a baby elephant small is not understanding zoology. A small enterprise organization is what made America a superpower. This is what's making China an industrial power. And this is helping India right now because it's that ocean that allows the intellectual fertilization of entrepreneurialism, commerce, and the bounds that requires and creates a very balanced and intelligent society. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So what can governments, and it almost sounds like it's an oxymoron to suggest this, but what can governments or political leaders do to uh, open up these opportunities in a world that's gone in the other direction? You know, uh, you cite the speech at Davos yesterday as uh, uh, embracing entrepreneurialism, but how do we go about making that happen? Very simple. Uh, take a look at the National Mobilization of Entrepreneurialism, the program we tabled 10 years ago, and shared with all the economic departments of 100 countries in great detail. And because my experience with Olympics, my experience with Fortune 500 company, 50 years of experience, we are not going to fool around. When we invent something, we know how to mobilize and how to carry a two by four. So now, very simple. National mobilization is identify, categorize, 
digitize all the entrepreneurial talent, high potential SMEs, put them on a respectable platform, put them on a digital platform, communicate with them in an entrepreneurial narrative, not as an administrator looking for tax numbers and forms and procedures and rubber stamps, and treat them on a, in, a, in a fashion that matches with the global demands of today. An entrepreneur, an, an enterprise in Indonesia or China or India is very different than what we have in North America, some organization that is sitting in Milwaukee or Shikutumi. So the challenge is at the cabinet level to come to a decision to say, let's bring the entrepreneurial brain and mindset, which is job creator mindset. The other is job seeker mindset. Job seeker mindset educates, develops, and builds the organization. Job creator mindset, not formally educated that much, but probably a dropout like Bill Gates and 50 others and his Steve Jobs and whatnot. Uh, I think Musk is maybe a rare example that he's got a PhD. But bring the mindset together, create a narrative, bring the people together, mobilize. And what does mobilization mean? That you have all the trade, all the chamber of commerces, all the group organization, all the economic development, you speak the same language at the same page. Technology allows you to do that. Connecting 100 people here, 500 people here, 10,000 people there, you are on a bandwidth, and in that bandwidth, you said here, we have now 5,000 or 10,000 SME, they are high potential, and in three months, six months, eight months, they will double in their productivity, performance, and profitability. You know, if you go back to the late 1950s in California, uh, the government or uh, in particular certain leaders there envisioned uh, Silicon Valley and they created a special economic zone. Uh, they created special rules. They created uh, special financing programs that allowed for the coming together of collective intelligence uh, that grew from you know Hewlett Packard and uh, to what it is today, um, do we need to have that kind of foresight? But not just in California, but in every country around the world. Yes, uh, absolutely. Look, I'm a student of Trudeau, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and and I learned that how institutionalization of ideas. Canada was one of the first country to open the Secretary of State. And Charles de Bois was the first minister back in the 70s, 80s. And that was the first uh, opportunity that I had with him and with the organization that brought me a deeper understanding of the SME challenges. You're absolutely right. It requires, by the way, a lot of governments, you will see the popularity of Ministry of Entrepreneurialism coming up from various countries. And we are very aggressive on it. And we are all turned key, ready to go. And I think that that one of the most amazing opportunity, while the half the world appears upside down, the other side is hungry for commerce, business, trade, but fair trade, honest trade, integrity, and not manipulation based, not some crazy scheme based, but real value creation based. And that is where all, by the way, for the first time in the history, billions of people have been replaced due to technology, misplaced because mismatching of the talent and displaced because of pandemics. All these people are looking for self-employment. They don't want to go back to cubicle slavery. So these are the people who will be the next generation of the jobs and the Musk and Gates who will come out with the new technology and so on. And if the government thinks that our natural resources and technology is going to solve it, or printing of currency is going to solve it, they will not be around for long. Third and final break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you.
So how does somebody get in touch with you and this program of uh, entrepreneurial mobilization? Um, what's the process for them and what will they receive by making this connection? Uh, just you said it, national mobilization of entrepreneurialism or SME revolution or Exphoton, go on to Google, you'll find uh, 100 references and detailed information and website and all the information. We are very transparent. We are, we are writing articles on it. We are debating it in the open public. And uh, what they will receive, we are suggesting that at the cabinet level meeting to table specific programs and mobilize it rather than sit and wait and prolong it. Because for the last 10 years, the history of the SME development has not progressed at all. Well, I checked out your website, and it looks to me that you have a, an incredible uh, number of contacts and, uh, in, you know, I guess important advisors or mentors that can uh, play a role around the world. Uh, how important is it that you have such a, a network, and then what does that bring to anybody who says, okay, I want to explore this? Uh, we are not uh, dealing with the with the commercial side of it, we are at the policy side, it public. We are with the government. I am connected with at least 100 ministers and deputy ministers around the globe, and maybe half a dozen ministers, prime ministers. But but the idea is this: we want to bring this open, transparent revolution to company to countries, and our dialogue is very open, candid, and very revolutionary in thought. And we are sharing this with knowledge and anybody who wants to participate and join at that level. We are, we are very happy to engage and uh, answer some very technical question answers. So you've got a, a team of advisors that can help others. Oh, absolutely. There's a large teams of people. Yes. Well, thank you very much for uh, uh, providing us with insights into the work that you're doing now. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stuart.